Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Colvin, and I am the Public Programs Curator here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I would like to welcome you to today's Food for Thought. It sure is great to see a bunch of faces here in the Farley Auditorium. And also welcome to all of you who are joining us online. And I am so excited for today's program because we've got some amazing speakers from our staff. But before we begin, I would like to have a few quick announcements. Next Wednesday, April 27th, we'll have the Alabama Women's History Series, Alabama Women and Art, where Seneca Edwards Bush will discuss the intersection of art and history in her, in her two paintings that are currently on view in our temporary exhibit, Justice Not Favor, Alabama Women and the Vote. And that's on our second floor. Open, open until May 31st. So I encourage you to please come and see her paintings, but also the rest of the exhibit. I'd also like, and that's a virtual only program, so it's only going to be available on our Facebook and YouTube channels. I'd also like to invite you on Monday, May 2nd, to our research rundown. And our research rundown reference coordinator, Courtney Pinkard, will discuss fire insurance maps. And again, that's a virtual only program on our Facebook and YouTube channels. I'd also like to invite you back to our Fee for Thought next month. On Thursday, May 19th, Paul Pruitt will present Education of Julia Tutwiler, Training for Leadership. And that is going to be a hybrid program here in our Farley Auditorium, as well as online. So you'll be able to come here in person or see it online, whichever is most convenient for you. Food for Thought 2022 is presented with financial support in memory of Mike Jenkins the Fool. Now, on to today's program. I am excited to introduce you to our two amazing staff members. The first is Brian Blocker, who is our Museum Collections Coordinator, responsible for the care and preservation of our museum collection of over 170,000 artifacts. He's a past president of the Alabama Museum Association and serves on the board of the Alabama Agricultural Museum and the Governor's Mansion Authority. Blocker holds a bachelor's degree in history from Auburn University at Montgomery and certification in collections care focusing on textile conservation from the International Preservation Center. Our second staff member is Georgia Ann Hudson, who is our communications coordinator. Her primary responsibility is coordinating agency public communications, marketing, and managing the archive development program. I would also like to mention that she is our in-house graphic designer. So if you go up to Justice Not Favor, you're going to see her amazing designs and our exhibit. She's a native of Baldwin County and holds a bachelor's degree in both history and studio art from Furman University. And hopefully, as they get the presentation, the sound will continue to hold strong. But if not, then the in-person program will be able to hear it as they will project, and we will try to get that fixed for you. So please join me in welcoming Georgia Ann Hudson and Ryan Blocker. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Alex, and we'll try and work through the sound, and if we need to change it, we certainly can. Well, it feels a bit unusual, I have to say, to be on this side of the podium for the last um, really decade, almost nine years, coming up May 1st. I have been responsible for trying to fill these seats into the programs. I'm so glad to see so many of you here today. And like as Alex said, thank you to our online viewers as well. We need a few uh, positive on the pandemic as we can now reach so many more people virtually. Um, Ryan and I have worked closely together as well for nearly going on a decade now. She is a close colleague and dear friend, and it has been a pleasure to work on this presentation as we've been here over the last couple of months. We also work together both for Schmidt to know and work with Bob Bradley, who many of you may know. He was our, is this better? How's this doing? Ooh, there we go. Much better. Great. I can do that. Um, Bob was our longtime chief curator here. Ryan uh, worked under him, and I, um, in my early years here at the archives, got to spend a lot of time with him as well. We really appreciate Bob lending his expertise to us as we prepared for today. And also, um, you will see a lot of what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, we really are standing on the shoulders of the in in incredible research that Bob did into our many of our museum collections, but especially this flag collection that we have here. And he is the one who began our conservation program three decades ago. And Ryan's going to be showing you some of the incredible results of that work today. So thank you to Bob as well. You'll be hearing his name a few times today. 
briefly about today's format since it's a little bit different with two speakers. In a minute, in a minute I'm gonna turn over this mic to Ryan and she is gonna talk about our collection as a whole, talk about why we preserve these flags and what they teach us about Alabama's complex Civil War story. And then she's gonna share some really fascinating examples from this nearly three decades long conservation program that we've had here um, that really show just this amazing work that, um, that we've been working with conservators to do uh, to conserve our flag collection. So you're going to see some incredible examples of that work. Then I'll come back and I'm going to share what has become a very big story about what is actually the tiniest textile in our collection. This three inch piece of wool, uh, wool fabric here in the case, um, something I stumbled upon kind of by accident or happenstance about a year ago. And it has led me down a really fascinating uh, re research journey. And um, I'm excited to share this new, these new discoveries with you today. So before we begin though, Ryan and I do want to acknowledge that the flags we are discussing do represent complex, controversial, and a painful period of Alabama's history. From the archives establishment in 1901 throughout the first half of the 20th century, collection and preservation of items related to the Confederacy was central to our agency's mission and featured prominently in the work of archives founding director, Thomas McAdory Owen, and then his successor and widow, Marie Bankhead Owen, who followed her husband as director of this agency from 1920 to 1955. Miss Marie, as we call her here at the archives, in particular embraced and disseminated a historical narrative that was steeped in ideas that validated the power and privilege of elite white Southerners. So while the Owens were compiling a rich Civil War collection that are, that's very important to how we understand and teach this complex period of our history today, they were also simultaneously ignoring and failing to collect materials that documented the lives and experiences of many other Alabamians. Many of the flags that you're gonna to see today, and including this remnant that we're gonna talk about in a bit, did come into our collections during the tenures of the Owens. And Ryan's gonna talk about that shortly. In June of 2020, our agency issued a statement of recommitment, which is available to read on our website. And that statement honestly acknowledged the consequences of racial discrimination in our agency's work in the early decades of our existence. But it also pledged an ongoing commitment to the inclusive preservation and sharing of Alabama history now and into the future. While response to that statement has been overwhelmingly positive, some have mistakenly interpreted our renewed dedication to inclusiveness to mean that we plan to remove or um, eject certain artifacts and records from certain periods of Alabama history. <clears throat> well, if you had that concern, let me assure you today that nothing could be further from the truth. Discarding collections is not part of our initiatives to collect, preserve, and share the stories of more Alabamians. And we hope that today's preservation, uh, presentation affirms our dedication as the archives to our core mission of stewardship and our commitment to presenting a clear-eyed, evidence-based appraisal of the past. So as we explore these threads of evidence, uh, you will see that our flag collection reveals many more stories than just those of the causes that they symbolized. And you'll also see that despite the extensive research of our predecessors, that there is still much to learn and discover about these fragile textiles. Now, I will turn things over to Ryan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And hello to those online and Facebook, including my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> I promised her I would give her a shout out. So as Georgia Ann mentioned, my name is Ryan Blocker and I am the Museum Collections Coordinator here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. It is my job, along with that of my staff who are in the crowd today, to preserve the over 170 artifacts in our general museum collections. And we truly have a diverse collection of artifacts. Everything from archeological material to my favorite textiles. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about our Civil War flag collection and explain how these flags came to the archives and demonstrate how we use them to learn more about the people and the communities in Alabama during the war. With that said, I'll start off with a little trivia or a statistic, if you will. Over the 145 Alabama Civil War flags known to have survived the Civil War, 91 of them are housed here and preserved here at the archives. That's over 63% of the surviving Alabama flags. 
Uh, and so the question is, how did we acquire so many of these flags? For that, we'll have to go back to the founding of our institution. So for those of you that don't know him, please meet Thomas McAdory Owen. He was the founder and the first director of the archives. He was also a man on a mission. Tom saw the need for an institution that would be the repository for the state's rich history. With his efforts, the archives was established in 1901, making it the first state-funded archives in the U.S. From the beginning, Tom was actively petitioning citizens of Alabama for material that would help tell the story of the state and its people. As Georgia Ann mentioned earlier, he was particularly concerned with gathering and preserving material related to Alabama's role in the formation of the Confederate States of America and the subsequent Civil War. Remember, the Civil War had ended less than 40 years before the archives was founded, and it was still in the living memory of most Alabamians. He was especially committed to preserving the flags of the various Alabama military commands. Tom began his quest for gathering Civil War related material by publishing circulars like this. This is circular number two, written by Tom in 1903. It issued a call for the donation of flags, banners, guidons, markers, or emblems that car were carried or used by commands from Alabama in the Confederate States Army. Because of petitions like this one, several of the flags in our collection came through donations by private individuals. For example, here we have the flag of the 36 Alabama Infantry. This flag in particular held special interest for Tom Owen because it was a flag under which his father served in the Civil War. Like many of the flags in our collection, the story of this flag and how it came to us is actually pretty interesting. Yep. Manufactured in Mobile by Jackson O. Beltnap, the flag of the 36 Alabama Infantry was issued to the company in 1864. Following the surrender of the regiment at Meridian, Mississippi in April of 1865, the flag bearer, Joseph Tillingast, crept back under the cover of darkness and removed the surrendered flag from its staff. He then wrapped the flag around his torso and covered it with his clothing. He slips away undetected, returning home to Alabama where he retained the flag for many years. Tom having special interest in this flag finds out that it is in the state of Alabama and he makes several efforts over the years to acquire the flag. Unfortunately, he dies in 1920, never having seen it donated to the archives. However, in 1957, and this is strange how it happens, but the widow of the flag bearer's son uh, uh, writes a letter to then director Peter Brannan looking for an appropriate home for the flag. And within a year, the flag is donated. So we've looked at how individual donations happened, but what about those flags that were captured during the war? When Confederate flags were captured, they were documented, and that would later go into the official records of the war. Um, and they were then sent to the War Department. For many years, Tom Owen, along with other historians in other states, petitioned the War Department for the return of these captured flags. In 1905, after several years of petitioning, and probably perhaps with some help from his congressman father-in-law, John Hollis Bankhead, Congress issues a joint resolution to return captured flags to their respective states. That year, 19 flags are returned to Alabama. Then in 1906, the War Department sends a couple of additional flags that they had mistakenly sent to other institutions. But Tom didn't stop there. Over the next several years, he wrote to other states and state agencies asking for the return of captured flags. You know, uh, companies that captured them would take them back to their state instead of turning them into the War Department. Before his death in 1920, an additional seven flags would be returned. So we've looked so far at three ways that they have come to the archives. The flags were through individual donations, 
through the War Department and then through other states and state agencies. But what happened to them once they came here? They were immediately put out on display. Here we have the flag of Admiral Raphael Sims that was on display over at the state capitol when we were housed over there. This is an interesting flag. wasn't actually used during the war. It was given or donated to Admiral Raphael Sims by um, English ladies, including Lady de Houghton, after his the sinking of the CSS Alabama off of Cherbourg, France. He brings the flag back to Alabama, and it was donated by his descendants in 1929. Here you can see the flags in cases lining the hallways. This building was open in 1940, so the material that was over at the state capitol comes to this building and it lines the hallways. Here you can see former director Milo B. Howard holding, um, standing actually in the same hallway just on the other side, but he's holding the flag of the 24th Alabama, also known as the Dickinson Guards. Uh, the flag was presented to the company in 1861 and was retained by one of its members for many years after the war. Uh, Miss Marie uh, took up the, uh, the attempt to bring these flags back and she actually made several attempts to have this flag brought to the archives. Uh, but unfortunately it doesn't come in until many years after her death and it came to us in 1963. So um, this is where I like to tell the story that Bob always used to tell us. Uh, Bob used to tell the story of how as a child in grade school, he was in living in Florida, but they came to Montgomery to the Capitol and he remembers coming to the archives and seeing these flags on display lining the hallways. And then when he was hired as the chief curator here at the archives in the 1980s, they were still in the cases lining the hallways. And um, Bob knew that from his work with the National Park Service and best practices that actually having fragile artifacts like textiles on display was not good for them. So um, he began, to take them off display and put them in better storage. You see the specimen cabinets that we have here. And then Bob brought in the experts. Here you have Bob who is in the center in the white lab coat. You have Fonda Thompson who is a textile conservator and Patricia Sweet who was a um, employee here at the archives. So Fonda was a conservator that had worked with Bob on previous projects at the National Park Service. So she came in to assess the collection and start giving us uh, treatment proposals or estimates on conservation. Um, with those estimates in hand, donations began to come through private donors. And with that, the flag conservation program was born. In the next few slides, I'm gonna highlight a few of the flags that we have in our collection. And you know, the ones particularly who have gone through conservation. And I'll tell you a little bit about their stories and show some of the really amazing before and after images. This is the first flag that was conserved by the archives in January of 1992. And it is the 22nd Alabama Infantry. And it's actually a really rare pattern. It's called the Polk and Bragcore pattern. It is only, uh, there are only two others with a white cross on a blue field like it. But unfortunately, this had gone through a very early uh, preservation, conservation process. And in that process, they put a substance on it that was almost like shellac. And it made the flag incredibly stiff. And the shellac was actually breaking down the fibers of the flag. So given its extreme rare a nature being one of only three of this pattern and the condition that it was in, it was the immediate first need. So here's the before and here's the after. So this is the 4th Alabama, also known as the Marion Light Infantry. It was commissioned by the ladies of Marion, Alabama. It was actually painted by Nicola Marshall. And George Ann's gonna tell you a little story about Nicola Marshall later. Later, um, later. later. <laughs> So this is a first national pattern and it is a painted silk. This would have been a very expensive flag to create. Um, 
it's also most people, this is what is known as the stars and bars, but most people get that confused with what is known as the Confederate battle flag. So um, here you have the before, here's the after conservation. And you'll notice in the center bar, there is a company designation. That's the, it says uh, Marion Light Infantry, Alabama. It's not uncommon to see designations or even mottos in that center bar for first national flags. But that's not the only thing. When I say Nicola Marshall painted it, here's the back before conservation. Here's after conservation. And you can see a cotton bale in the center of the flag and a cotton plant in the canton or the blue section of the flag. So sometimes the condition that they came in was really terrible. This is one of those ones that came to us from the War Department. And this one has a really interesting story behind it because we were able to use our own collections here uh, in the archival side to identify this. When it came to us from the War Department, it looked like this, and it was a hard rubber ball. And Bob said that you could touch it and it would almost fall apart. But um, in our conservation process, uh, we get letters back or images back from the conservator in progress to let us know how the flag is doing. And we started getting images like this as she was relaxing the fibers and laying it straight out. Uh, and the motto says, our homes, our rights, we entrust to your keeping brave sons of Alabama. And that rang a bell with Bob. He remembered reading a diary or um, the journal of Sarah Follinsby. She was a teacher who lived just on the corner here where the realtor building is. And she and her sister were sitting on their bale of cotton watching the Union troops as they would parade the captured flags around the Capitol after the war. And in her diary, she says, we were pretty well convinced they were trying to make an impression of large numbers, for we saw the conquered Hainville banner several times. They were circling the Capitol. Um, we knew it by the word tyranny being spelled with one N. And wouldn't you know, on the back side, you have a goddess of liberty breaking chains, and above her head it says, tyranny is hateful to the gods. With tyranny being mis well, spelled with one N. So here we have the flag of the 1st Alabama Infantry, also known, and I got lessons on how to pronounce this, Pierrot Guards. Uh, this flag was made by the ladies of Pierrot, but what's interesting, if you read the canton, it says, justice and protection to each new partner or new firm, Pierrot Guards. They were law students. They even took their books down with them when they went down to Pensacola because they didn't want to get behind in their studies. Uh, but this, again, most people would say, well, that's really not a Confederate flag, Ryan. It doesn't look like one that we're familiar with, but this is a Confederate flag. It's one of those large painted ones that you would see coming out of communities. Here it is after conservation. And you can see where it was actually souvenired. So when it was captured, it wasn't uncommon for those who captured it to snip out pieces of it and keep it as a souvenir. When we talk about symbolism in these flags, there's no other flag that exemplifies that more than this one. This is the 1st Alabama Infantry, also known as the Wilcox True Blues, and it was conserved in 2007. This is another one of those painted silk flags. Um, and it's actually mid-progress, that earlier picture. To get these fibers to relax, they humidify them, and then they lay glass blocks on them. And then they try their best to put this giant jigsaw puzzle back together. And you can see that here. Um, this is part of the painted section that over time has flaked or fallen apart. Um, I'll explain what this is in a little bit. But here it is afterwards. You can see what an amazing job that is. But look at this flag. There's so much symbolism in this flag. You have a coiled snake underneath a cotton plant with the Latin phrase, which I will try not to mispronounce, nola mai tangere. Uh, it means touch me not. Yeah, and it's Latin. 
But this is very reminiscent of the Gadsden flag from the revolutionary period that don't tread on me. And that symbolism being a coiled snake doesn't strike unless it's threatened. So what are they trying to say with this flag? With the cotton plant, the cold snake, the phrase above, they're trying to say, you can't touch us, you can't touch our cotton, you can't touch our way of life. So here you have the reverse of the flag. And this is also a pretty uh, bold statement. This is woman's offering to patriotism, Wilcox True Blues. And it would have been another goddess of liberty, which is very common in vexillological uh, symbolism. Here's before and here's after. Unfortunately, uh, due to souveniring, the only thing that's left of the poor goddess of liberty is her eye that you can see here. But this would have had a beautiful, and you can see parts of it, riverboat scene, and the riverboat has tiny little bales of cotton on it. So this is the 20th Alabama infantry. It was preserved in 2015, and I actually got to work on this one. Um, this is another one of those where it had previous conservation before, but the conservation that had done, been done before is actually harming the flag. Uh, this one had been sewn inside a net material, and it had been sewn front and back to the original flag. And those threads holding it to the netting were tearing the threads apart. So before it could be sent to the conservator, I spent, and this time grows every time I say it, a week and a half of uh, taking out the threads um, to get the flag out of the netting. And here's what it looked like when we finished. And to give you what it looked like before, and this is after. So uh, part of the process that we do with conservation is to do conservation and preserva preservation, not restoration. We do not want it to look exactly like it did when it was originally made. We want you to see every bit of battle, every bit of history that it's been through. But we do ghost in the final bits, the, the missing bits, like you can see here. So you get an idea of what the original flag would have looked like. So here is the last flag that we recently um, conserved. This is the flag of the Rifle Scouts, which was captured at Selma, Alabama on April 2nd of 1865. And it was captured by the 4th Ohio Cavalry. Now, um, you can see it is a mess. This is pre-conservation. Uh, when Diane and I, Diane is our textile curator who's in the crowd here, opened the box, bits of silk just rain down because it's in such a shattered period, uh, uh, such a shattered condition. But um, let me give you a little background on that. When it was captured, um, it was taken to Ohio, but it was actually brought back to Alabama by the same company that captured it. The remaining gentlemen of the 4th Ohio Cavalry here bring back the framed flag and give it to the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And this happens at Elks Theater in Huntsville, Alabama in the 19, um, 1910, actually 1909, and it's donated to the archives in 1910. But this is what it looked like in progress. It is amazing. To give you an idea of why flags shatter like this, um, during the process of making silk material in the 19th century, they actually, uh, silk was sold by the pound. So to make it way more, they actually soaked the silk in metallic salt. So little teeny tiny pieces of metal, uh, liquid metal like lead. And those pieces of lead over time with heat and humidity, as the fibers expand and contract, they work their way through the fibers. So you get what's called shattering and it looks like shattered glass. So again, when I say it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle to put these back together, it truly is. But uh, again, um, we talked to the conservator throughout the process and she called me one day and she's like, Ryan, I'm finding painted letters on this flag. Do you know what it said? 
And Diane and I had found a card in the box with the flag that said, Rifle Scouts, Death Before Submission. And I said, do you have enough letters? And she said, I think I might. So she started putting it back together. But the exciting part is not only did we get to work with a textile conservator, but we got to work with a paintings conservator. She actually started recreating the letters um, on top of the flag. And she did this through a fabric called Stable Text. It actually envelopes or sits above and below the original flag. And she could actually paint on those, but she could duplicate exactly the paint that she was seeing on the flag. And here you can see her in progress with that. And finally, we get the finished flag, which says Rifle Scouts Death Before Submission. So what happens to these flags once they're conserved? Well, um, some of them go to rest inside our textile storage area, and some go on display, and we rotate these out. In fact, we've just started rotating these out. Here you have, remember the Pierrot Guards? It's actually on display up in the early war, because it's the early war flag. Um, you have the 4th Alabama that you see here, the Marion Light Infantry. And then we have the 26 Alabama here. And uh, here's a new project that we've actually just finished as well. This is the uniform coat of Joe Wheeler, uh, or also known as Fighting Joe Wheeler. We just got it back from the conservator and put it on display. So why do we preserve these flags? Well, they are a fragile reminder of Alabama's social, political, and military history. We can use them to speak about uh, communities that came together to create them, and even the symbolism they use in the flags to express their views on the war. The flags also speak to the economics of the area. These very wealthy towns that are coming together and commissioning large painted silk flags that we've seen examples of. And then the later war issued flags, the, like the wool flags. And we can't fail to mention the artistry in some of the flags that we've seen today. But most of all, these help create a better understanding of the people and communities that created them. Now I'm going to tag Georgia Ann in, and she's going to finish up by talking about the uh, archive's smallest textile. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. I have to say it's a little intimidating to follow all of these big flags with such a tiny piece of a flag, but as you'll see over the next few minutes, um, it actually holds quite a big story. Um, so one of my jobs here at the archives is to compile and edit and design our quarterly magazine, Present and Past, which there are copies outside of our current issue. And if you don't receive it, let me know. I remember, I'm the communications coordinator, so I've got to promote that. But back in early 2021, I was working on a small um, section of the magazine to highlight the 160th anniversary of the start of the Civil War and the creation of the Confederacy that happened here in Montgomery in February of 1861. So I was looking for things from our collection that were related to that. And that's when I was first introduced to this remnant and came up in our files. And it was reported to be from the first national flag of the Confederacy. Now, I'm going to talk in a minute. There were actually three flags, official national flags that served as the national banner during the existence of the Confederacy. And then the battle flag, which is a, 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 a flag that was designed to be carried on the field. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, but this really became a personal uh, interest project for me, if you will, a research project. As I started uh, looking into the files and everything that we knew about the remnant, I realized that we actually didn't know as much as I thought we might. And as I started kind of turning over those stones, I kind of unraveled a really interesting story. And that's what I'm going to dig into a bit today. But before I do that, I do think it would be helpful to give a little context to what's happening in early 1861 with the creation of the Confederacy and especially the adoption of the first national flag of that new nation. So flags, of course, um, become very important symbols. And Ryan has shown you people, you say Confederate flag, immediately most people are going to think of the battle flag, maybe the first national pattern, but they look vastly different. But they are really serve as this um, a method to galvanize support and inspire loyalty to the new nation. And the Confederate Congress knows this when they set up the provisional government here in Montgomery in, eight, in early 1861. And they um, immediately establish a committee, a, they call it the Committee on Flag and Seal. And it's chaired by this gentleman, 
who was a South Carolina statesman, William Poche Miles. <clears throat> You know, Miles had been a former mayor of Charleston and then actually had represented South Carolina um, in the U.S. Congress. And he immediately sends word uh, requesting submission throughout the whole Confederacy for anyone who wants to submit a design uh, for, the, for the committee to consider and then present to Congress as a new national flag pattern. So um, according to his report to the Congress, his final report, the committee received nearly 150 submissions, but they were very frustrated because he describes that the flags either fit into one of two categories. They were either far too elaborate to be easily reproduced in mass quantity as a national flag would need to be, or they look too similar to the uh, U.S. flag, to the Star Spangled Banner. Now, Miles felt particularly strongly that we needed a complete, the Confederacy needed a complete deviation from the red, white, and blue. But there was a whole other faction that thought, no, who's to say the U.S. has a monopoly on that? We, we're going to show them we're going to be better. We want to retain something that looks similar. So they're very frustrated. Um, now, I will just deviate for one more, more moment to say there is a uh, long-held belief, tradition even, about and controversy about who designed the Confederate flag, which could be a totally separate presentation. So I'm going to just touch on it lightly. But um, Nicola Marshall is oftentimes credited as being the designer of the first Confederate flag and also the Confederate uniform. Nicola Marshall was a 19th century portrait artist. He originally immigrated to the South from Prussia. Um, he uh, teaches at the Marian Female Seminary in Marion, Alabama. And in the early 20th century in particular, there's a big push to find evidence that he actually designed the flag. Um, that has been ongoing for a while. I will just say in the official congressional report that Miles submits and in some correspondence from Miles soon after the war, no designer is ever named. And contemporary newspaper accounts from that period specifically say that the design originated with the committee because the committee did not like any of the designs they had received. And so they come up with four of their own that are submitted to the Congress for approval. And the final design that they select looks like this. And this is what is known as the first national flag. And I say that because there were two additional flags that followed. Um, and this flag is actually from our, um, our collection. It was a flag of Gage's battery. So it's an early flag because it still maintains. So this is what the original first national pattern looked like. So it had with seven stars, which were the seven original states to secede. Over time, a few more stars will be added. Um, and then, of course, the large um, red blocks on either side of the white center block there. Those were chosen to symbolize truth, purity, and valor. Now, this flag has an interesting story. Briefly, I'll tell you. Um, you can see these strips. Uh, Ryan and herself believe originally it was intended to be a U.S. flag. And once the first national pattern was adopted, it was assembled into this pattern. And it's also um, suffered that shattering process as well as a silk flag. But as I stated, there were three flags that served as national flags patterns for the Confederacy during its existence. So soon after the first national is adopted, um, the people who were very against this pattern um, kind of have some validation because at the Battle of Manassas, this flag looks very similar to a U.S. flag. And there was a Confederate unit that actually fired on another Confederate unit because they're also their uniforms had not become standard at this point. So quickly, soon after, uh, Miles consults with uh, General PGT Beauregard and also General Joseph E. Johnson, and they propose a, a flag to only be used on the field. And that's where the battle flag comes in with St. Andrew's Cross um, in blue with white stars on a red background, which, as we know, here looks dramatically different than the U.S. flag. But a couple years later, the Congress decides we need to approve a new flag because this one is just too challenging to use. So they come up with this design, and it's known as the stainless banner. Now, it has problems, too, because at rest, this appears as a surrender flag. So that doesn't work out too great, but the war continues. And at the very end, in 1865, just the last few months of the war, they do adopt a third national flag. It looks like this. They just add a red stripe here at the end. Um, and very few of these flags were even made or used. And I'll just note all three of these are part of our collection. So back to that original first national, first, first national flag. The four submissions are submitted to Congress and they choose, of course, the pattern I just showed you in March of 1861. And according to Miles's account, immediately the design is taken to George Cowell's Dry Goods Store, which was located at 49 Market Street, which is now Dexter Avenue, so not far from where we're seated today, where according to Miles's account, it was sewn by fair and nimble fingers. 
Then it is immediately taken over to the state capitol. And on March 4th, 1861, in an elaborate ceremony, it is flown for the first time. Now, interestingly, they planned the ceremony and uh, they asked Miss Letitia Tyler, who was the teenage granddaughter of former U.S. President John Tyler, who lived in Montgomery with her family, to raise the flag. Also, the ceremony was intentionally timed to coincide with another really important ceremony happening the same day in Washington, D.C., and that was the inauguration of President Abraham Lincoln. The design of the flag being reminiscent of the U.S. flag and the symbolism in the ceremony of having the granddaughter of a former U.S. president and, of course, being exactly timed to coincide with the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln was intended to show that the Confederacy really intended to become a great and powerful nation. Even newspaper accounts at the time, this is from the Montgomery, the weekly advertiser here in Montgomery, reads, when the time had arrived for the raising of the banner, Miss Tyler steadily and with heart throbbing with patriotic emotion elevated the flag to the summit of the staff, cannon thundered forth a salute, the vast assemblage rent the air with shouts of welcome, and the people of the South had for the first time a view of the Southern flag. Long may it wave over a free and prosperous and united people. So, we know it flew that day in March, but what happened to it after that, that actual flag? Details are really scarce, and you have to remember within hours of the adoption of this flag, news is going out across the South about this pattern, and hundreds of these flags are being made, and within weeks, copies of this flag are, are popping up everywhere. So it's a little bit challenging to trace one single flag when there are so many now that all look the same. But we do have a few clues. There are two important newspaper accounts. They're very small but important. They come out of South Carolina. They're both from the Yorkville Inquirer, Inquirer, which was in York, South Carolina. The first is from a few weeks after that ceremony on March 28, 1861. And in it, it just simply says that uh, William Poche Miles, remember he was from South Carolina, on his return from Montgomery brought with him the original flag of the Confederate States, which he presented to Mrs. Pickens. Now that would have been Lucy Pickens, who was the uh, South Carolina's first lady, with the request that it be hoisted over Fort Sumter. A couple of weeks later, the bombardment of Fort Sumter happens immediately after this newspaper article is recounting that of those events. It talks about the flag being raised and says it was the intention to have made use of the flag that was first hoisted on the Capitol in Montgomery, but unfortunately it had been mislaid. So one other important clue is some post-war correspondence between these two gentlemen who we've already talked about, uh, William Miles and uh, General PGT Beauregard. Miles actually served as his aide-de-camp during the war and they were close friends. Miles writes him a letter in 1872 and in it he says that the flag was in his possession for some time, but it was lost during the war. Another important detail from that letter also states, Miles says that the original flag was made of merino wool, there being no bunting at hand. Keep that in mind. I'll come back to that in a bit. So when I first began this research, so that's all the background kind of that we know in the, in the historical record about what happened um, with the adoption of that first official flag of the Confederate nation. But what did we know here? So I went to our files, of course, our curatorial files, which were rich with information um, that Bob and others have compiled over the years. And what we did know about the remnant in the case here um, was that it came to Alabama in 1950. And this is correspondence between um, a man named Stephen T. Riley, who was then the librarian. He eventually becomes the director of the Massachusetts Historical Society. This is correspondence between him and then Alabama Governor Jim Folsom. And it simply says that the Council of the Massachusetts Historical Society voted to return this remnant that is reported to be part of the first national flag of the Confederacy to Alabama. And Governor Folsom writes back in appreciation and says that it's gonna be placed here at the uh, Department of Archives and History. Miss Marie also writes a letter back expressing her appreciation and enthusiasm and says that she's going to personally place it in one of those cases that, you, that Ryan showed you earlier. Um, and she also, though, requests some more information. So along with the remnant is attached this simple card and it says, piece of the first Confederate flag raised over the Capitol at Montgomery, gift of William C. Todd, July 12, 1866. And then it says, see proceedings of the Massachusetts Historical Society, page 248. Miss Marie asked Mr. Riley, please send me more information. I want to know who Mr. Todd was. Can you send me a copy of the proceedings? Well, apparently, as far as we can tell, that never happened because this is where the file ends. 
So this is really where I began. I was, again, and I've sort of learned around here, sometimes I'll say, this will be a quick and easy thing to write. And um, sometimes that's not always true. And that was not the case here because I thought, well, let me see. I wonder what else we know about this. Maybe these proceedings are available online. So within minutes, I found myself on page 248 of these proceedings thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to be so interesting. Well, it certainly notes that at their July 1866 meeting that a man, William C. Todd, had given two donations, this remnant, and then a completely unrelated collection of materials from Pennsylvania. It also says that two letters were read from Mr. Todd at the meeting, but it only publishes the one about this other unrelated collection from Pennsylvania. Nothing more is said about the flag. <laughs> so my immediate excitement eventually, initially just plummeted to disappointment. And that's probably why Mr. Riley didn't provide any more information to Mr. Marie, because there really wasn't much more to tell from these proceedings. But an important clue was that there was a second letter. So I thought, well, I mean, maybe that letter is still somewhere in the files at the Massachusetts Historical Society. So I found their website, found some, some folks to email and um, told them what I was looking for. And what you know, and a couple of days later, and I'm very grateful to a couple of archivists there, um, Ann Bentley and also Dan Hinchin, who searched their uh, administrative files going back to 1866 and found the second letter. So this is really exciting because, I mean, likely this letter probably has not been seen in a century and a half, so you all are some of the first people to see it. Um, it's a simple letter, obviously, it was written in Mr. Um, Mr. Todd's handwriting, so... What did it say? Well, the letter dated July 6th, 1866. And in the letter, Todd writes, I offer the enclosed to the society as a piece of the first flag raised over the Capitol at Montgomery, Alabama, when the Confederate government was in operation, February, 1861. I obtained it at Montgomery last April from a janitor of the Capitol who gave me the above assurance. He is a colored man, was formerly a slave, and has occupied his post as janitor for nine years. Todd goes on to say, the man said the flag was used a little time, but soon gave place to another, which he showed bearing marks of much use. Also interesting in the letter, Todd gives a little bit of insight about the conversation they had. He says, we spoke of the excitement and enthusiasm attending the inauguration of the new government and the crowds that assembled at the, in the Capitol Yard, the illumination of Montgomery, the speeches, et cetera. And this is in reference likely to the inauguration of Jefferson Davis just across the street at the Capitol in February, 1861, which is what this image is from. And then finally, Todd concludes his letter by saying, I have no doubt myself of the genuineness of this piece of flag as represented. So, wow, right? <laughs> I was absolutely stunned when I read this letter. I think I remember running to our director, Steve Murray, and saying, oh my goodness, look what just came in my email from Massachusetts. Um, because I never expected a story like this um, to be related to, to this little piece of wool. So, What's really important about this letter is it introduces us to two important people in this story. One we heard a little bit about first from our original index card, and that was William C. Todd. And the other is this janitor who's working at the Capitol and worked in the Capitol throughout the Civil War and is still working there immediately after now as a free man. So first of all, who was William C. Todd? Well, he was actually quite an interesting person. William C. Todd was born in Atkinson, New Hampshire, and he was a very well-known 19th century New England philanthropist. He was an educator. He was very progressive-minded, and he was a particularly passionate about education for women. And he was also an ardent supporter of public institutions and was a historian himself. He provided the funds to establish the first free reading room in the nation in his small New Hampshire hometown. In 1888, he also provided the funds to um, erect a stone monument uh, dedicated to the memory of those from his town who had died fighting for the Union during the Civil War. Also, uh, speaking to the wealth that he had, in 1897, he gives $50,000 to the Boston Public Library to establish a public reading room. And because of an appreciation for his gift, this is what the room looked like then, they erected what's called the Todd Tablet at the Boston Public Library in appreciation for his gift. In later years, up until his death in 1904, he served as president of the New Hampshire Historical Society, which is where that portrait I showed a minute ago is today. 
Interestingly, I'd found a copy of his 1901 memoirs and he led a fascinating life. There's chapters that just recount all the famous people he met in his life. He seemed to be everywhere. But in it, he does say that right after the war ended, he says so early that Richmond was still burning. He traveled through the South, talking with the people and, and learning about what they had just experienced. So by his own account, he places himself here in Montgomery um, right after, very soon after the war, because according to the letter, he's getting this piece of fabric from the janitor in April, 1865. So it is just, you know, right as the war has ended. So that's Todd. What about this janitor? Well, all we really know at this moment is that what is what Todd describes in this letter. He was, we know that he was previously enslaved and as of 1866 had worked at the Capitol for the previous nine years. So this means he was newly emancipated and had retained his janitorial position. We have done some preliminary searches in state records, I'm grateful to my colleagues down the hall in the research room to see what we could find about work, uh, enslaved workers in the Capitol, um, about how that arrangement would have worked or newly free people. And so far it's a real archival silence. We've not been able to find anything that really speaks to this. But now because of this letter, and this is what I am so, um, has been so exciting for me. Um, and what I think is so powerful about this story is this, this letter is now brought back into the historical record, this man and others like him, who before this project um, were really lost to history. So it's a whole area of research that we still need to discover. This letter also confirms two important reports that we had about the flag, but this letter helps to substantiate those that we know now that it is in fact from a wartime Civil War period flag and that it did originate in the Alabama State Capitol. But it still doesn't really tell us if it was actually from that first flag. And again, don't forget, we have another um, line of evidence that shows the flag going to South Carolina. But what the letter does not do is also just as important, I think, because while it answers some questions, it really raises many, many more. What motivated this man to give Todd the remnant? What conversations did they have? That's what I'm wanting to know more about. Um, we know Todd was a historian himself. He would have understood the significance of a piece like this. He was also progressively minded and he likely maybe spoke to a man that others may have just walked on by. They obviously must have established some rapport um, for the, and some trust for the man to give him something like this. And then how did the man himself obtain the fragment? Was it something he just had in his pocket? Um, and Todd writes in his letter that he, the man showed him a flag that replaced the original. So I wonder if maybe one of these man's, this man's responsibilities was perhaps taking care of the flags, raising and lowering them, that type thing. Some of these questions we'll never be able to answer, but it's interesting to try and draw some conclusions from what we do know. So we've come a long way. I hope y'all are still with me. But let's look at all of these threads of evidence and kind of where they lead us to this moment and where I kind of have stopped in my research project, not stopped, but where I'll, I'll call it a pause um, and where we are today. There's certainly more investigation that can and should be done. And it's likely impossible to definitively prove or disprove the small, that this small piece of wool um, is in fact from the original first national flag without finding some other additional uh, records. But what we do know, there is still very strong primary source evidence that the first national, the first national flag, first first national flag was taken to South Carolina. We have our two period newspaper accounts and that letter, it's a very significant letter from Miles himself to um, Beauregard and just not, not even barely a decade after the flag first flew. So that's an important account that we can't ignore. But Todd's letter is potential evidence that somehow the original flag or at least a piece of it did remain in Montgomery. And it, directly, um, and it directly contradicts the other story um, of, about it going to South Carolina. But it's possible to imagine a situation, maybe the janitor saved a piece, maybe it tore off when he was taking it down. There's a lot of possibilities that could say that this piece is still from that first flag. But I will say, I will come back to one other important piece of evidence from that letter. And I mentioned it earlier, the letter, the 1872 letter between William Miles and General Beauregard. Um, Miles states that the original flag was made of merino wool, there being no bunting at hand. Most flags throughout the war are going to be made of bunting because merino is a far more expensive, finer wool. I will say though, just so we all know, and this is a bit of scientific evidence, this is actually a piece of bunting and not merino wool. So that would also potentially contradict, contradict that bit of information. 
So all that brings us to where we are today. There's still many questions to be answered, some we probably will never be able to do conclusively, but it's exciting that this new research has connected a piece in our collection to Mr. Todd, who a man who led an interesting and influential life, and it's also given us an introduction to this janitor and others like him who filled vital roles in the physical building that housed Alabama's seat government. Their stories still need to be told. So thank you all for being here today. I will say that the story of this remnant appeared in the uh, fall 2021 issue of Alabama Heritage Magazine, which I hope you were all subscribers and you can also get a subscription if you join the friends. But copies of that article are available if you all would like to take one home with you today. Um, again, thank you. And Ryan and I would love to answer any questions. I think we have a few minutes. Maybe just one. Changes over time. Oh, thank you. I know it changes over time, um, depending on the condition. But generally, how long does it take to conserve one of the flags? Um, it's depending on the actual what it's made of. If it's silk, it generally takes about a year to two years for conservation. Wool can take a, a year for conservation. Oh, we have a question right here. Yes, I have a question. How many bow flags was captured during the Civil War? Well, we know that for Alabama, there are 145 surviving flags, of which we have 91, in particular battle flags, because you have company flags and then you have the um, battle flags. I'd have to, that's a good research question that I need to, to, but 145 total are surviving, 91 are here at the archives, but that's Alabama Civil War flags. But um, I am going to look that up and make that answer available. Thank you for your excellent program. If the original flag did get to South Carolina and is still in existence, is there a little piece missing that was corresponding <laughs> yeah. to that? That's a really great, great question. We actually, when I started this, Ryan got in touch with um, South Carolina and their museums and to see if there was any, any yes and no and Bob Bradley who we've mentioned a lot he actually was the chief historian this is another great part about this project he was chief historian at Fort Sumter before he came to the archive so he was able to say it was definitely a South Carolina flag that flew there the other thing to keep in mind and I sort of talked about this earlier there were hundreds of copies of this flag being made so it is possible that the first flag is in exist in is still in existence, but if it didn't have a label, no one would be able to know that was the actual one versus one that was made, you know, a week later. So it's possible, but as far as we know, one has never been identified. As and do such. you have in existence later flags that flew over our capital, plus some of the first flags that flew over this building? Our flag collection is extensive, and we have flags from every conflict that Alabama has ever been involved in. We do have some flags from the state capitol, um, and I, I don't know about flags that we have that have flown over the archives, um, but I would like to say yes, but I, I, I don't remember any right offhand, but we do have flags from the state capitol. Oh, I have another question. Also, how many regimental flags and company flags were made for Alabama infantry? Oh, that's a really good question. One I was not expecting. <laughs> um, I'd have to look that up. I know that um, there, the run through from 1st to 60th, um, but I couldn't tell you regimental and battle flags right offhand. I'd have to do a little more research for that one. I'll also mention our flag collection is available online through our digital collections, and Bob um, produced a, a flag report that's really extensive, and all of that is available online. You all can find that through our digital collections. And this uh, remnant, you can study it closely there as well. Yes. You say that uh, the archives has about two-thirds of the Confederate Alabama flags. 91 of the 145 that survived. Okay. Do you know where the other ones are? <laughs> and is there an effort to 
get them? Yes. Um, well, number one, so we do know where some are, uh, well, of the 145, we do know that some are in other states. Iowa has uh, some, and um, there are others in other institutions. Um, I think we did a trade with Arkansas uh, during Bob's tenure here to get a flag that had been sent by the War Department to Arkansas that was uh, an Alabama flag, and we had an Arkansas flag, so we just did a switch. Um, but throughout Tom's tenure and later Marie's, uh, there was switching. In, uh, there were acts of legislation that were created to bring flags back. Uh, but are there active efforts to bring, like, say, the Ohio or the Iowa flags, the flags that are in Ohio? Um, I. Ohio and Iowa are going to get me Iowa back. No, um, there are uh, private entities that are trying to get those flags back, uh, but we are not. Only because um, those capture flags, while a part of Alabama history, they're also uh, a part of Iowa history and those companies that captured them. And uh, we know that the ones that are in institutions are being well cared for. So um, I hope that answered your question a little bit. This is a could be for our last question okay. right here. I've, this is just a bit of trivia, and I've hesitated to mention it. But back during the centennial, mm -hmm. 1961, we participated in that, and I had the honor of raising the flag that Letitia <gasps> Tyler. Uh, 100 years later. Are, are you related to her? Because I oh no. Okay, okay. I thought I remember reading I somewhere that it, okay. Uh, That's so interesting. No, no, but yes. Somebody just said you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you to Georgia yes. Ann and Ryan for a thank wonderful you. presentation, and I also thank want you. to point out. If you would like to take a closer look at our tiniest textile, it is currently up on the stage right here. Um, and so you can come and see if you're in person. And to everyone, thank you so much for joining us, both in person and online. I, I look forward to seeing you again next week online for our Alabama Women's History Series and next month right here for our Food for Thought. Thank you.